And we come to the fifth of the songs or love poems. Uh, begin with verse 8. Uh, verse 8 through 17 is the fifth of these love poems. Um, and this one is, it kind of jumps now uh, going back to that time during the courtship in, in Lebanon. Uh, it's, if you will, uh, perhaps she is recalling here, and this is in the, the words of uh, the, the bride. Uh, she's recounting what she remembers and what he has said to her as uh, she's doing all the speaking during this. Uh, it is, we said it's uh, set in a time in uh, Lebanon. Uh, during the courtship days is a visit that Solomon made to her vineyard home. Uh, so as we look at this, in verses 8 and 9 to start with, as she speaks here and she describes his approach, said, The voice of my beloved, Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. And so, as she describes here, and, and different cultures and at different times have developed their own little phrases or idioms uh, of, of comparison and, uh, and so these may not seem that romantic to us. You know, saying he's like this roe or heart, which is a deer, you know, skipping along the mountains. Uh, but, well, we all have kind of a fond place in our hearts for Bambi. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, and I believe the idea here, uh, you know, the, the young deer is robust, is strong, and is swift and sure-footed. And so these are the, the qualities that she's seeing in him and, and describing. But particularly here, it, it begins, the, the voice of my beloved. The voice. Um, and I think there's a great message. This particular uh, poem it has a lot of good, rich thoughts in it. And hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them this evening. Uh, but it is just one of those jewels. He said, the voice of my beloved. You know, when we as human beings in our lives, when we fall in love, and we know the voice of our beloved, our loved one. And when we hear that voice, it cheers us. It makes us happy. And the spiritual application, I believe, should be obvious to us. How we should long for and desire and delight in the Word of God. For that is His voice. Uh, speaking to us. A voice that only we can hear. And uh, we, we see some things here. Psalm 119.
mentioned some of the other things and talking about the, the sweetness and all. This is something we all can identify with and, and appreciate. Uh, our, our taste buds. And I believe God has, you know, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We are created uh, with the ability to taste things. And, and those things that are particularly pleasing, things that are sweet. And it's a delight to our taste buds. And um, if you understand, that many times the, that taste, it, it causes the brain to signal, and it, uh, it, I'm not sure which one of the glands, but it secretes certain enzymes and things in, uh, into our system, the endorphins and things. It just makes us feel good. And so I think chocolate is one of those that's supposed to, you know, have that effect. And so physiologically, emotionally, you know, these things are tied together. And so the, the scriptures, you know, as, as we would, and I, I think of Brother Ben making the, those uh, baklava, 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 uh, and, and how sweet that is. And that kind of comes from that part of the world uh, with the, the, the dates and nuts and different things they use in them and the sugars and the sweetness. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, we think of those things that, that are sweet and how pleasant it is and it encourages, well, that's the Word of God. That, that's supposed to be the Word of God to us. I mean, you know, now Paul, he's more of a steak and potatoes man, I think, because he describes it as like meat, you know. <laughs> And there are things in the Word of God that is, that is strong, and it helps us to be strong. And, uh, and David is saying that it's the sweet, you know. So it, it's all those things to us. It's nourishing to us. It's pleasing to us. And, and how we should desire uh, that, that Word of God. And, and there, there's so many scriptures. And, and the Bible indicates that only we as God's people truly hear and understand His Word to us. Uh, in, in John 8, 47, says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. He that is of God heareth God's words. And, and there's many other scriptures that we could turn to that uh, it elaborates on that same th uh, thought. You know, uh, the natural man cannot receive the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And so on. And uh, and I was thinking, you know, how many times couples will have their own little language. They have their own little, uh, little phrases and names for one another and so on. And maybe uh, references, you know, it's kind of an inside joke or whatever. You have these things from your personal experiences and, and likes and dislikes and whatever that you two share and you can talk about things and other people won't understand what you're talking about. See, that's the way it is with God and His people. That's the way it is with Christ and His church, His beloved. He speaks to us in a way that only we can understand. It's not meant for the, the lost. It's not meant for... Uh, those others, uh, but it's His words to His church, to His bride, to His people, His beloved. And so, the voice of my beloved, she says here, and, and uh, she recognizes, she hears it, she delights when she hears it. And I believe that we as His people should have that same thing. And uh, she describes Him uh, here with those attributes. She sees her beloved as swift and strong and sure-footed. So we can see the attributes of our Lord. He is mighty to save, swift to hear, and respond to our cries 
for help. He is, you know, able. And uh, he is strong. He is swift. And, and as we think of his attributes, you know, as she looks at the beloved's attributes and she describes them here just briefly, but as we think how the Bible describes the attributes of God and how uh, we respond to those things. You know, like when uh, Paul was there in Romans 8 and was describing the attributes of God, the sovereignty of God, and he says, what shall we say these things? How we respond to that? Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, she describes him, and then she goes on here, um, as said, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. It's as though, um, you know, we're here upon the earth. This wall uh, uh, of flesh, the uh, uh, spirit, God is spirit, and we cannot see him. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. We're here upon the earth. But it is, as it were, we have glimpses of him uh, through his word and what he speaks to us. We have glimpses of him uh, as he reveals himself to us. Uh, makes himself, uh, his presence known to us through hearing and answering our prayers and, and supplying those things that we need uh, through his spirit uh, that is with us. And so it's like, you know, here's this wall. She's on one side, he's on the other. And through the, the window with the lattice work in it, you, you kind of get a glimpse of him on the other side. And so that's kind of where we are, you know, we get these glimpses of Him and uh, how it ought to make us long for Him. And there was a number of scriptures I was thinking of as seeing Him who is invisible. You know, He is Spirit. Uh, he's at the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. We're here upon the earth in the flesh. But as seeing Him who is invisible and uh, many scriptures, He's the image of the invisible God. Uh, king, eternal, immortal, invisible, and so on. And so, as a matter of fact, Romans 1, 20, it's talking about the invisible things of Him are clearly seen. That is in the creation. And so we see His eternal power and Godhead in these things. And so through God's Word and, and by His Spirit that dwells in us, bearing witness uh, of His presence, um, and so then she begins to describe here uh, in verse 10 uh, what he says to her. Uh, beginning with verse 10 through 13, she says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle, the turtle dove, is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Mm -hmm. He asked her to, you know, as I read that, and you, you think about that, and I was thinking how many times you know he's saying, it's as though Solomon comes and says, it's a beautiful spring day out. Won't you come take a walk with me? That's what it's describing. You know, Lou and I, a lot of times, we'll, we take walks together. Uh, we used to, uh, we lived in, in uh, Washington. We actually lived on no, we lived in California. We was on Washington Street. We was kind of in the middle of the block. And something we just like to take a walk. Get away from the kids, walk, and we can talk to one another. And so we just kind of walk up to one end of the block and back down to the other end. And if there was any problems the kid needed us, we was only a half block away. You know, more than a half a block away at any time, they could come out and get us. And we just walk. But you know, even now sometimes we'll look out and say, you know, that's nice out, won't you? Let's go take a walk together. We'll walk out through the parking lot and over around the 
gazebo, whatever. But, you know, that's kind of that desire. And how nice it is when it's nice out. It's warm. It's not too hot. But, and he's kind of describing this is the late spring, early summer. The winter is past, and he's describing these things. You know, the flowers are in bloom. It smells nice. The birds, you know, they're, they're singing and chirping. And it doesn't just make you want to get out and just take a nice walk. And again, God has created us with that uh, appreciation for those things, an appreciation for His creation. And He's put all these things in the creation for our benefit. But there is something else that we see here in this, just as we can kind of see that and how we enjoy that ourselves. How we like getting out with our spouse and just taking a walk and smelling the flowers or listening to the birds chirping and so on. Uh, all these pleasant things. God has designed and desires fellowship with His people. That is why He created us. I, I preached a, a whole message on that idea of how we are created in the image and likeness of God. And in that creation account, God looked upon man and said, it is not good for man to dwell alone. And man was created in the image and likeness of God. And we see all these different ways in which we see attributes in men that uh, reflect the attributes of God. You know, the appreciation of beauty, des desiring uh, fellowship and these things well, that was His desire. That's why He created man. Mankind was created to be the helpmeet to God. As He created woman to be Adam's helpmeet, and they became husband and wife, we see that very relationship is merely the type of the relationship between Christ and His church. Read there in Ephesians 5, he says, now this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and His church. He's been going, talking about husbands and wives. You know, husbands, uh, wives, obey your husbands as uh, to the Lord. And, and men, you love your wives as uh, the Lord loves His church and, and so on. He compares it back and forth and finally gets down to that one verse. And he says, now this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and His church. Husbands and wives, the marriage relationship is a type of the relationship in the Old Testament, God the Father and the nation of Israel. Israel was His wife. In the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ, the Son. God desired that help me to have that fellowship with, to uh, have that communion with, that companionship. And that's why He created man to fulfill that role. And that's why even when Satan came along and sought to destroy that relationship, God didn't just erase everything and start over. He purposed to redeem a people unto Himself. Because He loved them. And so, as we see, uh, talk about there in Romans 8, we're talking about for whom He foreknew. That, that idea of foreknowing has to do with the uh, love he loved beforehand. He set His affection upon them. And because of that affection, uh, He purposed the, to bring about their redemption. And so we see here in this, the desire of the groom, the desire of Solomon uh, to have that stroll, that time of fellowship and communion with His beloved, uh, with His love, He was the beloved, with His love, as it reflects Christ and His church and His desire to have fellowship and communion uh, with His people and with His church. Uh, he desires our company and fellowship. Um, we read over in 1 John 1, That which 
In verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have fellowship one with another. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And so this walking in fellowship, and, and I would say that whenever we're walking, anytime we're walking in fellowship with the Lord, it's a good day. It is a beautiful day out when we're walking in, in fellowship uh, with the Lord. Uh, what a, a wonderful thing it is. And, and I thought, you know, it brings into focus, especially when we contrast that, Jeremiah 8, 19. You know, what, what a sad contrast. Now, people have used this and preached from this. Jeremiah 8, verse 19 and 20. Uh, it says, Behold, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people, the cause of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. Now here is just kind of the opposite. Uh, the Song of Solomon, the winter is past, you know, the spring has come, the rains have come, and, and they are past. The flowers are in bloom, the things are being fruitful, uh, the birds are singing, the sun's shining, it's a beautiful day. Uh, isn't that what we should desire to have? He desires to have fellowship with us, and so we need to walk in the light, as He is in the light, uh, that we might have fellowship with Him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This verse that's often, so often misquoted. And as a result, they miss the picture. If you think of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 in light of what we just read here in the Song of Solomon, what Solomon was saying to her, it's a beautiful day out. Come take a walk with me. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, there was the wall. You know, and all there. But he says, Come, come out here with me. Come and, and uh, take a walk with me. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will come in and have fellowship with him. I'll come in with him. That, that God desires uh, that fellowship uh, with his people. And, and with his church. Verse 14, we see he expresses his desire to talk to her. How many times have heard wives, one of the biggest complaints is they want to talk to their husbands, but the husband's too busy, too distracted, whatever, doesn't want to listen to them. Here it is the husband initiating. He wants to talk to his bride. And how certainly the church ought to desire to have that communication. So, oh, my dove that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. 
You know, just as she thinks her, his attributes are, uh, he's handsome, he's strong, he's all of these things. He's, uh, and she says, my beloved's voice. Well, he reciprocates. He's saying, I, I, I want to hear your voice. You are beautiful to me. You know, I look upon you, you you're beautiful in my sight. And I want to hear your voice. And, and he desires to talk with us as well. Jesus desires to look upon us as his church and to hear our voice. Our voice that he desires to hear uh, is to declare the gospel to the lost. To teach the whole counsel of God to the saints. To lift up our voices together in unity and praise and song and thanksgiving and supplication to Him. The church that is faithful is beautiful to Him and in His sight. And doesn't matter what the world thinks of us. To Him, His church is beautiful. And then, while he's at it, he calls attention to the fact that, you know, our, our fences need some repair. Because, remember, the whole thing goes back. Uh, Solomon had some vineyards, had property up there, and he leased it out to these people to, to keep the vineyards for him. And he was up there visiting. That's when he uh, met this woman and fell in love with her. And he said, by the way, I noticed some of the fences need repair. He says, um, in verse 15, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. You know, that one's been preached on a lot too, the little foxes. And, you know, the fox, if, the reason they had walls and fences, if you will, hedges about the vineyard was to keep out the foxes and other animals. But sometimes the little, the little foxes, they can get through a little hole. And the idea of the little foxes, these are a type of little sins that gnaw at the roots of the vine of our testimony before others, making us unfruitful. It's the little sins. That's the little holes in the wall. And, and as we look at this both as individuals and as a, a church as a whole, I, I think many of these truths apply. We can take these things and apply them to ourselves as individuals and uh, members together uh, of the, the Lord's New Testament church. Um, he called attention to some things that needed to be taken care of. The little foxes were getting in. He said, if, you, if the little foxes get in, they uh, gnaw on the roots and it'll spoil the vines because our vines have tender grapes. The vines are tender. And so the little sins in our lives and the little things in the life of the church, now the church needs to, to be aware of these things. And, and it's just like the Lord here, you know, when we go to the book of Revelation, the first, uh, the second, third chapter of the letters to the churches of Asia Minor, to the seven churches there, and these have been referred to sometimes as the Lord's love letters to His churches. And if you notice, as you read through there, and He starts out commending the church. He says, I know thy works. I, and, and He lists the things that they're doing right. But then He says, However, I've got some problems. I have somewhat against thee. And then he would show, this is what needs correcting. This is what needs to be brought back into line. And so he goes down through uh, the churches uh, that way. And so he invites you to come out and take a walk with him, to have fellowship with him, to enjoy the beauty of the day with him. And he said, and by the way, these fences need repair. You know, 
know, you need to be careful. These little foxes will get in and spoil the vines. And so then it closes as he begins to stroll away after having spent the day with her. And she's looking upon him as he goes away. She closes with this. And my beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. And that, when I said, when it uses the he feedeth, it's talking about he feedeth his flock. You know, and reminded of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You no, know, he leadeth, you know, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. That's where he feeds his flock. And she says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. Well, blessed assurance. We, we sing that song. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. And what a wonderful thing. Even though. He's in heaven and we're here upon this earth. And we're looking forward to that time when He'll come back for us. And as we read here, you know, it's kind of jumping back and forth. This is almost like a flashback. We know that one day we'll be with Him in glory. The marriage of the Lamb will take place. The new heavens and the new earth will come. And the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride for her husband will, will come. And this time now will be just a memory. And so this is kind of written now as though it's kind of a flashback. Because it started out, she was already in the, the palace. So, you know, the wedding has taken place. And and those things that we've already read. And so this is kind of a flashback. And she's remembering that time that, that they first fell in love. And that, they, uh, that first, um, uh, those good days. And those memories. And that is one of the things that we need to do. And so this assurance, you know, we, the Apostle Paul says, I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. John says that we know, you know, we know, we have that assurance, we can have that assurance. And even though they was parted for a time, she knew, my beloved is mine. They were engaged. You know, when Lou and I were engaged, and before we came together, we were married, but we were engaged. She was mine and I was hers. We might be apart for a while, but we knew we were going to get together. We were going to get married, Lord willing. We have to add that. Of course, we know He's willing in, in this case. He's said so. And he's already shown us the end from the beginning. But we have that assurance. We may be apart right now. But I belong to Him and He belongs to me. And nothing can separate us. That's what Paul says. He goes on there and describes that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is given to us in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. So until, it says, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. She, as he departs, she said, okay, you know, depart. Until we meet again. Until you come again. Uh, we, we look on that, that promised day that He's going to return for us. If I go, 
and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. And so, we look forward to that until that day break, that eternal day. And the shadows flee away. This life will be over and we'll be present with the Lord. And it's like she goes back to where she began when she first saw Him. And I was thinking about that, you know, how good it is even in, in a, a marriage. When people have been married for a long time. It's good to go back and remember that first, how you felt at the very beginning. You know, what was it that... that caused you to love that person in the beginning. You know, sometimes life goes on, and, you know, and, and you get older and you get grumpier and, and different things and, uh, and, and, and you're focusing more on the faults and things like that. How about going back and remembering what it was like at first? That's what Jesus told the church at Ephesus. Because you've left your first love. You need to go back. Now, sometimes I think we, you know, we, we need to remind ourselves what, what was it like, you know, when the Lord first revealed Himself to us and that He loved us and He gave Himself for us and He first saved us and that, that zeal, and that ardent desire, and that ardent love that we had for the Lord. We need to remember that. You know, and that, that time between now and when He comes back, we need to remember what that first love was like. I think it's good advice for married couples too, to go back and remember, what was that first love like? What was it, you know, how did you feel? I, I can, I remember this one morning, when I had talked on the phone the evening before, and she came out to the house and I can remember vividly you know the sun was shining one of those beautiful day the sun was shining she pulled up in her little white Chevy got out she had on this blue dress with white pleats in it she come kind of sat shame because it was kind of on a, a bit of a hill so she was walking from the car down she was kind of just walking down I, I remember that Hardest. <laughs> but it, it does good to go back and remember those things. Uh, and so she closes that remembering what she saw at the beginning. Those attributes and those things. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging in His love for us. What a blessing. Let us stand together then.